Well, good evening. We're starting the book of Joshua tonight, and uh, we've got two sets of notes stapled together. One is page one and two, and the other is, after that, is page one, two, and three. Uh, so if you would turn to the second page one, the second set of notes, it's, it's the Merdepta, Merdepta, uh, steel, uh, which was, it has an inscription about Israel. Kind of two things you want to talk about is the time of writing the book of, of Joshua and then the author. And this is kind of interesting. Kind of, We're going to go through the book verse by verse uh, and teach the, uh, the history, but also God's interaction with Israel, Joshua being a man of faith and following after God, how the people respond, uh, talk about the Canaanites. So we'll go through all those things, but tonight it's kind of interesting to see that the time of writing uh, is going to be during the days of Joshua. And I'm going to try to show you that the author is Joshua. Now again, there's different ways of thinking about this. The, the extreme uh, liberal scholars, the minimalists, the one to pretend none of these things happened. There was no Abraham, there was no Joshua, there was no David. There was all fabricated, and that, or else just based on some ancient legends or something. But yet, when you get into the text of Scripture, there's proof, and it's not, it's not an unacademic thing to consider, that the author of this was Joshua, that he was an eyewitness, and we'll show you some things here tonight, some of the verses, and that it was written right there during his lifetime after he saw these events. Now, as far as the time of writing, this first steel that we're going to look at, this it's the Murnapta, from Pharaoh Merneba from 1202 BC. You can see that picture right there on there. It's got you know, the Egyptians there at the top, across there. And it's a monument that he set up, of course, for his battles. And there in the bottom of the steel right there is a, a little white box that got written there, or drawn around there. That is a phrase there where he mentions the word Israel. In fact, he's going to, and I'll show you this in just a little more detail here, He's going to actually say that he has attacked the Israelites in the land of Canaan, and that's 12 to 1205, and has uh, destroyed them. Which means you've got two dates, basically. You've got the early date of the Exodus. And again, this, this you know, uh, in a sense, it's not important, but yet at the same time, it, it's, it's, for me, it's crucial. And when you start getting into the authenticity of Scripture, it, it's important. Because if you're talking about historical events, you're going to have to have these things happening at a real place, real time. And if you start removing these from time, removing these from a real place, removing them from history, and they're just stories like King Arthur and the, the Round Table and the Knights, and they're just legends about dragons, uh, you're going to have to treat them like they treated the, the writings of Homer, just some kind of trying to find some kind of meaning in there. Uh, and yet this is God revealing himself not just in writing, but revealing himself in interactive, hist historical interactive with his people, taking him out of the land of Egypt. Real place, real time, and we should be able to track these things. And this is one of them because there are two dates for the Exodus, and that's going to help us put the timing of the writing. Is one, it's going to be in the 1200s during the days of Ramses, the, the Pharaoh. And remember, the book of Exodus talks about it, they were building where the storehouse of Ramses was. And that makes many people just try to go right to this date of Pharaoh Ramses. Now the problem with that is, is multiple, is, is you're going to have to really crunch in some time. You're going to have to have 40 years of, in the wilderness. They're going to have to have Joshua enter the promised land. You're going to have to do the whole age of the judges to get to about 1050, between 1200 and say 1050, when uh, Saul begins to reign, 1010 when David begins to reign, and then 970 when Solomon begins to reign, you're going to have to squeeze into this 150 period in, uh, years of time uh, a lot of activity. If you can push this back to 1400s, let's say, and we're going to give you some specific dates, uh, you've got a lot more time for those things to take place. This is the more... Biblical. This is the more biblical date. I'll give you the exact dates here in just a minute. But nonetheless, what we have here is Pharaoh Ramses at the very top of this article. It says, and if actually, what I did, I cut and pasted this off of a Facebook post I put on a couple of years ago. It popped up, and I, and I saw it, 
And I thought, well, I, this is useful. So I just cut and pasted the actual Facebook post that I wrote. So Pharaoh Ramses uh, ruled from 1279 to 1213. So if he's going to be the Pharaoh of the Exodus, that means the Exodus has to take place in the 1200s. Is often considered to be the Pharaoh of the Exodus by many scholars. And when you start reading books, they'll go for this date. And that's just, it's just, they think it's a, a better date. Because there, it says in Exodus, they're building the, the storehouses of Ramses. But what that can be, as, as you look at that, that, that reference to Ramses could be explained by being, it's where Ramses was, the city of Ramses was at that time, but the, the storehouses were in a layer down below from the 1400s. But when the people were reading it, this is the date, that, the place that they were familiar with, but nonetheless. Um, I, write, I decided years ago when I wrote the framework of Christian faith that Thutmose II, 1508 to 1503, was Moses' stepfather, Pharaoh, father, and Thutmose III, 1482 to 1450, was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Now this is not nothing strange. This is what the what we would call the early date and the late date would decide. And I go with the early date. I'm going to give you some more specifics. Uh, again, I put this in the framework book also. Thutmose, which is a family name, Mos is a family name, that may be why Moses is known as Mos or Moses. It's right there. He came out of the family of the household of Thutmose. And so right there, his name Moses, it, it remains. They just dropped the name of the God. The name of the God was dropped, and he kept the family name. What was recently re-explained to me is that the significance of the Mern of the Stel, or Steli, which was recorded by Ramses' son, Pharaoh Mernopta. So after Ramses comes Mernopta. Mernopta. Is that how I spelled it correctly there? Uh, so this is his, he reigned from 1213 to 1203. In the year 1205, he set this up. This was set up in the year 1205. It's, it's dated on there with Egyptian years. And so he sets it up in 1205. So listen. Historically, not historically, archaeologically, or in documents outside the Bible, in 1205, Ramsey's son, Mernatha, sets this stell up, and on it, he indicates that he had attacked and destroyed a nation called Israel, located in the land of Canaan. So he went into Canaan, in 1205, or the months before that, fought the Israelites in Canaan and defeated them. Now that would be right during the days it would be, see, if you've got, this is pretty solid, if you're Bible, you're within a few years, I mean, we're talking months. Saul becomes king in 1050, David becomes king in 1010, reigns for 40 years, and Solomon becomes king in 970. Again, right in there, that's pretty solid. So if he's destroying Israel in the land of Canaan in 1205, it's certainly not in the 1400s when Joshua first enters, or the first years of the 1300s, like the, the first century, the, you know, like 1390, 1380. This is getting deep into the days of the judges, which where we are heading next after Joshua, going into the days of the judges, which will, th this is all important, all this, like we said yesterday in church, all this Bible you need to go back and understand it in the context of the time frame it was set so you can see the people, you can see the events, understand how the world works, how God intervenes, and then from that point you can come over and look at your world and say, ah, because God is the same, human nature is the same, interaction is the same, you've got the same evil forces trying to come against humanity, against the plan of God. It's just a different time zone or different time frame. But the judges during this time is going to be, uh, it's ridiculous. It's, a, it's, 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 almost a, it's almost like comic relief when you read the book, uh, the book of Judges because of the ridiculous things that are taking place. And we'll look at that. In, 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 that's in 1205. But anyway, the judges is taking place. So it would fit that the, Egypt would come up and overrun the land at that time because Israel is disorientated, it's disconnected, and God is going to bring judgment on them. Nonetheless, 1205. Um, located in the land of Canaan, when he states, among many other things, Israel has been wiped out, its seed is no more. 
And again, typical of Pharaoh writings, this is something you can see in all the Egyptian writings, is that they, it's propaganda. You talk about the media. I mean, we think we talk about fake news, fake news. Uh, there is a trend throughout human history to present fake news, meaning you don't write about your defeats, you write about your victories. You don't put war monuments up to your losses. You put war monuments up to your victories. Plus, if you lost the war, no one's going to let you put up a monument because the victors are going to put the monuments up. And so the Israel or Egyptians were known for this. So anyway, they may be ex exaggerating, saying their seed is no more. That would mean Abraham's seed has been wiped out. It's mentioned by the Moabites and Ammonites in a similar fashion later on. This steel of Mernapta proves that Mernapta's father, Pharaoh Ramses, could not have been the Pharaoh of the Exodus, since there would not have been enough time for them to, one, leave Egypt, wander in the wilderness for 40 years, be led by Joshua through five years of military campaigns in the land of Canaan, settle down and become known as a nation between Ramses and Mernapta. Now you can say, well, maybe the 40 years wasn't a full 40 years. Well, you're still going to have to have the Exodus. I mean, they're going to take a few months to get Pharaoh convinced Israel's leaving. It's going to take a few months or a few years to wander through the wilderness and come in through the, the east side across the Jordan to Jericho. Now, they could have gone straight up. It would have been faster. But if they're going to go around, it's going to take a couple years just to get everybody moving. And then you've got to conquer the land, which clearly takes five years. I mean, you're just going to walk in, defeat Jericho, and you control the land. You've got to move through the entrance campaign, the southern campaign, and then you've got to march all the way up to Hazor and take out some of the leading cities. And then you, all you've done is establish central points where you've taken uh, control of the entrance to the land, the southern part of the land, the northern part of the land, and you're still surrounded, as we'll see on the last maps we've got in here, you're still surrounded by Canaanites that have not been defeated yet. So you're going to have to have a large, long period of time to leave Egypt, to go through the wilderness, to enter the land, to have the battles, and then to be known as a nation that the Pharaoh is going to be able to write, I defeated the nation of Israel in the land of Canaan, they all are no more, in, in one generation. So I mean, this really slams this idea here. There are going to be critics that are going to continue to support it because this has been out for years. Um, but that, there, there's no way. And we're not even talking about the Bible yet. We're just looking at this event. Meaning Israel had to be there as a nation the next generation after Ramses, which doesn't make sense that he'd be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Because right after they leave, his son goes up there and destroys him. And if it's really Joshua taking the land, he'd be invading right on the tails of Joshua. These people are in no mood to be conquered by the Egyptians. They're going to drive them back out. Well, anyway, um, it goes on and says, There are many other things to be said and explained, but to understand the books of Genesis and Exodus, the Bible student must first abandon the incorrect dating of Exodus uh, to the days of Ramses. Look instead to the time of Thutmose dynasty. When Ramses' dating is abandoned, many situations and dates change, including the false assumption that Jericho fell before the arrival of Israel. Now, when people say, the critics say, when Joshua got there in 1200 B.C., Jericho was already, its archaeological already been destroyed by 1200. It's kind of like, so Joshua, they say when Joshua got there, he crossed the Jordan River, and it was already in ruins, and all he says is, hey, write this down and say we destroyed this. Let's keep on moving. Well, that's, again, assuming you've got the wrong, you've got this date. Indeed, I will agree. By 1200, when you come across the Jordan River, Jericho is in ruins. How come? Because it fell in 1406 when Joshua got there. So by 1200, indeed. So, yeah, if you erase this date and go back to this date, all of a sudden now Joshua's marching into a city that is a very powerful city. And so if you get the wrong date, your archaeology doesn't line up, and you start saying, well, that's not true, that's not true, there's no proof of that. Well, yeah, because you're two centuries off on your dating and your archaeology. But if you get it right, it, it goes on and says, that is because Israel arrived, okay, it tells you all about those things. Much of the skepticism and criticism from the 18 and 19 hundreds becomes irrelevant with updated dating and modern archaeological discoveries. So just like when we talk about the New Testament being misdated, the book of John and different things in the 1800s, modern scholarship and modern discoveries have proven, wait, we are in the right arena. And now with that, turn the page, and you can see right here, you can see the, the steel right here. On the next page, there is the... Uh, uh, you can see where it was on the that front page, where it was at, I had it in a square. 
In the middle picture on page two, you can see the actual hieroglyphics where it says the word Israel. And then right above that is a transliteration and translation of the Myrna, Myrna uh, steel, where you can see right there, uh, Israel laid waste, not exist his grain or his seed. Syria has become a widow. In other words, Israel's been defeated. And that's, that's what's being written there on the, the hieroglyphics. And there's just a picture of the pharaohs and stuff at the top. Page three gives you another indication. It shows you in detail another, this I got off the internet, just an image right there. Shows you where Israel's at located. There's just a picture of the entire steel. That's in Cairo in the museum. I would like to go see it someday. Now, continuing on the dating of this, go to your Bibles. That's archaeology. That's, that's, that's an inscription by the Egyptians that says, Merneptah, the son of Ramses, in 1205, defeated Israel in the land of Canaan in 1205. It's going to be hard to imagine they did all of that in 40 years and became a nation in 40 years. But if you go with the, the date I'm going to show you, that puts it exactly during the days of the Judges. I'm not going to deny that Mernup uh, went up to Israel and fought the Israelites, or fought in Canaan against the Israelites. I'm not going to deny that because in 1205, right around that time period, indeed, everyone's overrunning the Israelites. The guys bring in raiders and they're having trouble because they've been disobedient. So let's go back to the Bible. Let's go to uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter 6, please. 1 Kings chapter 6. And now we're going to be talking about, again, we're in the days of Solomon. Now, if you will allow me to do this, you're going to, and again, all this can be challenged, and again, you should challenge this and think about it, but at least you got you something to start with. In 1050, that's about the time Saul becomes king. He's going to reign for about 40 years, and then David is going to become king about 1010, and David will be king. And he's going to reign for about 40 years. Uh, the first seven years is outside of Jerusalem. So about 1003, he takes Jerusalem and sets up the kingdom from Hebron, moves it to Jerusalem about 1003. Then Solomon becomes king in 970 B.C. And he's going to begin building the temple after the first, well, here it is. Chapter 6, verse 1. And what, now, now, this is... This is your Bible, okay? This is your Bible. In the 480th year after Israelites had come out of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Zib, the second month of their year, this whole, their second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. Now, that, that, that's when he begins building the temple. So you know the month that Solomon began building the temple of the Lord. It's the 480th year. They've been, the, the, the Exodus took place 480 years before the fourth year of Solomon. Now, the fourth year of Solomon is 966. Again, you, you get, it doesn't give you dates, but this matches. This is a, it does tell you 40, 40, 40 years, and does say from the beginning of his reign four years later. So we're in the ballpark. So let's take 966 right here. 966, and then we erase all of this. So I got some room. And we're going to add 480 years to it. And right here in front of everybody, there's 6, 12, 13, 14, carry the 1, 10, 1446. BC, according to 1 Kings, that is when Israel came out of Egypt. So that's when they came out. If you want to play with this, how long did the ten plagues take? Would it take about a year? I mean, they didn't happen, you know, in a month. They didn't happen in a week. I mean, you've got to go through all those. There's some kind of recovery. There's people negotiations going on. Uh, you could say that Moses went back into Egypt in 1448, 1447. Uh, Possibly. And then how long was he in the wilderness? We got another 40 years. So now you got Moses going to the wilderness in 1488, 1487. Now you got Moses being born in 15, you know, take 20 years off of that. Uh, 1508, uh, 1528 is when he was born, or something like this, as you put all those years together. Because he had 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years uh, in the desert, or in, watching the sheep, and then 40 years. As in the Pharaoh's household. 
But anyway, we're back to 1446 for the Exodus. Now you take off 40 years from that of wandering the wilderness, you now know when Joshua enters the land. 1406 B.C., Joshua is entering. That's when he's walking across and conquering Jericho. And now everything fits. Uh, it fits with the, the, the line of the pharaohs. It fits with uh, the entrance. It fits with the archaeology, with the Jer Jericho being there. It then gives you time for the seven years, of the five years of battle, the couple years of dividing the land up of Joshua's time. And so Joshua's going to write his book. If you have 1406, you've got five years of battles. Again, you don't just have him coming across conquering Jericho, we win. You've got the entrance campaign. Then you've got to take out, you've got the situation with AI, different things. And there, if it turns south after the entrance campaign, they've got to turn south and conquer the south. And then they've got to regroup and they've got to march up to the north and take out the major cities on the other side of Megiddo, uh, you know, the, the, uh, um, the, the, the Jezreel Valley, and go up north to Hazor and have that battle. And that battle, they're excavating it right now and it matches Amun ben Tur, the archaeologist, we stood right by him and watched him excavate the place. Listened, I've got video of him talking and explaining. That's where we even had a snake crawl across my feet while we were there and got that on videotape. And he kicked it down into the pit down there and told him to kill it with a shovel. But Amun ben Tur, from the Hebrew University, he's been excavating it for years. He says, he, he, he says this, is, this is what it is. And he is finding, what he's looking for, he wants to find the archive of Hazor. And we'll talk about it because it says Joshua... Burnt hate soil. And we saw the burn layer. We were there. He showed us the burn layer. And he's excavating and he's doing it scientifically slowly, year after year. He wants to find the archive of the letters that are coming and going in and out of hate soil from other countries to find out some more information. And hopefully he'll eventually. He's found the palace. He's, the last time we were there, he was excavating the main entrance gate. Um, and we, we saw the palace, we saw the burn layer. Of what Joshua, when he gives credit for Joshua, and when we get to uh, Hazor, we'll go through the details of it. The fire got so hot, there's a, there's a shattered statue of the god or the king that was there in the palace that was shattered. The flames got so hot that it galvanized, not galvanized, uh, uh, when, when you talk about clay, and when you cook clay in a slave. Glaze, yeah, it glazed the clay. It got so hot. So you can see the burn layer and the glazed pottery from the fire that was set. It says right there, it says in the text, he burnt Hazor. Joshua burnt Hazor. And there it was. Nonetheless, that all fits this time. Now, so if you've got a five year of entrance, or not five years of battles, and then you've got two years of kind of dividing the land up, you've got Joshua, subtract seven years from this, okay, and now you're at 13. 99. And if Joshua writes the book, you know, he, if he's right, taking notes as he's going, he's, he's taking notes from 1406, 1405, 1404. Or if at the end it's all done, the land's all divided up, and now he sums it all up, or then he takes all of his notes and edits it, it's 1399. We're talking, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's pretty, we're talking 1399. And that's why I'm going to present this. I'm not going to present this that they wrote this over in Babylonian captivity and made some stuff up because it's ridiculous. Because of the details that are in this book, it's ridiculous. It's not written like a legend. Oh, right, there's miracles in the book. But yet, if you're watching the miracle and recording it, it's different than you're just writing a legend. You're talking about seeing the miracle take place. So we're, we're talking about the author is this. I'm going to show you. It's the author is Joshua himself with a few additions by some people that had to write and finish it up after he died, and we can show you who that was. But he's writing this in 1439. That's according to 1 Kings. Now, you got some of those dates right there. Remember, 1399, seven years, if we go, I mean, we don't know for sure, but it's five years of inter or it's five years of campaigns, a couple years to clean it up. You've got about seven years before Israel is in the land, and now they're living and they're starting to build their kingdom, which then by you know, 1205, they can be overrun. You've got about 200 years before the Egyptians come up, and then they can write that burn up the uh, uh, steel. Now, another verse. Uh, the next verse, go to Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11. And there's going to be a judge named Jephthah. We'll get to Jephthah here. In, you know, in, when we, we're going to the book of Judges after the book of Joshua, but don't get excited. Uh, that's not going to happen in the year 2020. Um, but Judges 11.26, 
And what is taking place is Jeff has been asked by some of his family members, some of his tribe members, to come and help them because they're being attacked very quickly. Here is Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea. Here's the Jabbok River. Here's the Arnon River. Right here. And over here in Gilead, now you remember Gilead from like Tuesday night, we're talking about Gilead. That's a place where the Arameans and, uh, and Israel did a lot of fighting because there, the trade routes ran right through here. But the people of Israel who are living in Gilead are getting pressure from the Ammonites down here, Ammon, and, and they're, they're being attacked. And they say, Jephthah, we need your help. We need your help. So he goes off here. And they've been so he's going to go down here, and he's going to talk to the, the Ammonites down here, and they're going to say, hey, you know, this is our territory. You, you took it from us. And he's going to go through, and you can read the whole detail. We're going to spend a lot of time detailing this on what's going on here. Uh, but look in chapter uh, 11 in verse 14. What verse am I? I'm heading for verse 26. Look at verse 14. Jephthah sent back messengers, messengers to the Ammonite king. This is what Jephthah says. Israel did not take the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. Moab and Ammon right here. We didn't take that. God told us that was your land. But you attacked us, he's going to say, and we had to fight because you attacked. We're just going to pass through because they want to do this. M Moses wants to come up through here and cross the Jordan at Jericho right there or at Gilgal. And when they pass through here, the king decides, Shihon the king decides, I'm going to attack. He says, well, now you attack and now you're, when you attack, it's like gambling. I mean, Come on, folks. I mean, we need to catch up with history. I just, I've been working on my genealogy, and there's so many wars. We went back to so many generations. We're talking about fighting in the Crusades. We're talking about fighting against William the Conqueror. We're talking about losing battles and fighting, you know, all kinds. And then we got great grand. I thought I had one great great grandfather in the Civil War. I ended up with three or four great great grandfathers in the Civil War. Not to mention, we got a couple of them who mentioned the Revolution, and so do you. It's not like, oh, aren't you special? You understand, I'll I, I tell you this real quick. Well, by the time you get back, you've got two grandparents, or two parents, and then you've got four grandparents, then you've got eight, it just keeps doubling. By the time you get to your, what is it, your 32nd generation, whatever it is, you've got eight billion, eight billion, 28 times great-grandparents. In other words, I've got more great-grandparents living in the year, what is it, you know, 1100, and again, I've got all the information, 1100 AD, then there are people on the earth, which means the genealogies have to, you start off right here, it's just me, but remember, I go back two, four, eight, just keeps multiplying until you have eight billion, but eventually, if there's not that many people on the earth, the, the genealogies have to start bunching up and overlapping, because guess where they're heading? They're heading back to Noah, which is one. So you got one at both ends. So you're going to have this swell up here, but somewhere in the middle here, it starts to interact and overlap each other, and then you come out, and here we are today. But nonetheless, what I noticed there was how many people were fighting in wars. I mean, conquering land over and over again. Everyone's land has been conquered. But nonetheless, Jephthah's point is, we were just passing through, and you attacked us. And when you attack us, he doesn't say it this way, but it's like gambling. You lay the money on the table and you lose the game. You lose the money and say, well, I'll take it back. That's my money. No. When you play the game, you laid the money on the table. Uh, I'm not encouraging gambling, but that's the way you gamble. If you lose, you lose. And if you attack someone, you're putting your nation on the table. You're putting your land, your government on the table. And if you lose... You lose your government, you lose your culture, you lose your land because you bet it in a war. I mean, it's like, well, that's not the way we want, that's the way history rolls. You lose, you lose. And we're the conquerors, we put up the monuments. Well, anyway, that's basically what Jeff is going to say here is, now we're off, off subject, but I'm trying to build the case for you. This is what Jeff says, Israel did not take the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites, but when they came up out of Egypt, Israel went through the desert to the Red Sea and to Kadesh. Da, 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 da. Next, verse 18, next they traveled through the desert, skirted the lands of Edom and Moab, passed along the eastern side of the country of Moab and camped on the other side. They did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was its border. 
Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who ruled Hezron, and said to him, Let us pass through your country to our own place. We need to pass through your country right here to our own place. Um, uh, Sihon, however, verse 20, did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. He mustered all his men and encamped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. Now that was a stupid move because now you went to war with us and now you put your land on the table. Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Shihon and all his men into the Israel's hands and they defeated them. Israel took over the land of the Amorites who lived in that country, capturing all of it from the Arnon to the Jabbok. Uh, and from the desert to the Jordan. So he's saying, this land that you're, you're, you're complaining about, you attacked us, and we defeated you, so you lost your land to Israel. Thank you very much. You want to play again. You want to play another game of pool. Put some money on the table. You know, that's what, what he's saying. Um, now, verse 23, now since the Lord, now since, verse 23, now since Yahweh, the God of Israel, has driven the Amorites out before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? Now, see his logic? God, our God, helped us win this. And then he goes on and says, our God helped us win this. Will you not take what your God, Chemosh, gives you? In other words, we took Yahweh and went to war against you and Chemosh. And now, Yahweh defeated you. Now, wait, you're going to see how, how long ago this was. The key is he's going to say how long ago this happened. And now you're going to say it's your land. It, it's not. Because, one, we went to war against each other. Your God versus our God. We took it because and we didn't even want to take it. We just wanted to walk through it. And you said, no, you can't, and began to attack us. So we had to defend it, and so we won the land. You lost the game. What's wrong with what Chemosh gives you? Likewise, whatever the Lord our God has given us, we will possess. Are you better than Balak? And he goes through and gives all the other people that they were defeated by. Now, he ends up by saying this. Look in verse 26. Well, here's, here's the key verse. That's why we're here. Verse 26. For 300 years, Israel occupied Hezbon, Aurora, the surrounding settlements, and all the towns along the Arnon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? For 300, get that number? Jephthah says, we have been in possession of this land for all these cities all along the Arnon for 300 years. What took you so long to want to take it back? If you wanted to take it back, you should have went out and said, this is our land and attacked us at least sometime before three centuries have gone by. Because we've built buildings, we've established communities. You lost it three centuries ago. Three centuries, you lost it, what, 15 generations ago. And now you say, it's my land. Okay, that's a little bit about war. But our point right here is they lost this land 300 years ago. If Joshua came into the land in 1406, Jephthah is king, minus 300, Jephthah, not king, he's a judge in the year 1106. Did I do that right? 1106 B.C. Now again, you're going to put in here, watch how this lines up. He's one of the judges. He gets the time period of the judges. You're going to have Saul is going to become king in 10, 1050. David, 1010. Saul, or, or Solomon, 10, or 970. So this is Jephthah, Saul, David, Solomon. And this right here, 1406, is Joshua. And there's your 300 years right there between Jephthah and Joshua. Now again, you add your 40 years onto that, and now you're back to 1446. There's your Exodus and Moses. Moses, 40 years in the wilderness, Joshua. 300 years for the book of Judges. And again, you, it, it, the book says, you say, well, I don't know if it took that much time. I don't know. It's like, well, Jephthah is saying that it was 300 years. He's not saying 1106 or 1406. He's saying 300 years between my day and Joshua's day. So that's how it fits. And you see that that fits. This is plenty of time for a few years of, of Joshua. Uh, and then the, the people are living in the land, and then you're going to have a decline. Then you go, Jephthah is the ninth judge that is listed. 
And that gives you room for all of the judges. Again, the judges are not going to be like a kingship where they're going to come one one after. They're going to be overlapping. And they're coming from different parts of the country. So while Samson's down here, there might be someone up. Jephthah might be up here. But nonetheless, there's another date from, if it's 1406, Jephthah is 1106, which is not ridiculous. Watch how ridiculous it is if the year is 1205, say, yeah, you know, in Ramses' day or whatever, when Israel was defeated, you know, and you subtract 300 years from that. Now you're at the 900, say 930 to 900 AD. Now you're now you're heading down into the days of uh, Elijah is, is when the days of Jephthah. It doesn't even line up. So there's your biblical evidence. You can say what you want to about you know, the minimalist, that it's not true, that these are all just stories. But if you look at two verses, you're going to get this date right at 1406. And the exit is taking place at 1446. And then you've got the Mernapa uh, cell explaining that. So anyway, that gives you a time frame of what I think we're looking at here is the book of Joshua is 1406 going into Jericho or into the promised land. You've got five years of battles. You've got two years to kind of settle them. But they're going to have the boring part of Joshua is when they start dividing the land. We've got chapter after chapter of just the land being divided up and boundaries. Joshua's going to get you bound from this rock, then you get that big group of trees over here to this little pond, then you come down to the river, then back over to the, the hill, and then back up here, and that'll be the land of you know Zebulun. And that's what's going to take place for you know, a couple years. So when this is all said and done, Joshua's going to take the book, the, the events of Joshua, 1406 to 1399 BC. And that is a biblical date. That matches, gives you plenty of room for everything. The exes, you don't have the overlap thing. You read things literally as historical events. And then you can start bringing archaeology on and start supporting it with archaeology. And if something doesn't match, you, you've got to consider it. But if something doesn't match, you can't consider that someone over here has got another agenda. Just like we've got fake media, we've got fake science, you can have fake or misunderstood uh, archaeologists and people trying to put things together. So keep looking for those dates. They're, they're not, they're, they're biblically supported. Okay, now, going back to page one of the first set of notes. Um, and that, that, that very back page, page four, what, you got some numbers right now, that's basically what I just got them saying. Any questions about that? Any thoughts? I mean, I think it's kind of exciting when you see those dates all lining up. Now going back to who wrote this. Um, and we can go through all the different options. Again, you got some people that think someone wrote it like, you know, many years later. Or, you know, the ideal of the campfire. You know, like when I was a kid, we were told, well, these stories were handed down year after year, generation after generation. They'd sit around the campfire and tell these stories. Like there are a bunch of cowboys, you know, rounding up horses for centuries out in the wilderness and just telling stories around the campfire. And then they just, eventually somebody wrote them down like fairy tales or something. That's what I was taught when I was a kid in, in Sunday school. But when you look at these things, this, the books, I mean, Moses is giving you a play-by-play. -play. I mean, he's, Numbers is a play-by-play. -play. Deuteronomy is him actually talking to the second generation about what just took place, the previous generation. So you've actually got Moses teaching to his second generation what they messed up on in the first generation. That's the book of Deuteronomy, recounting everything. Numbers is the historical account. Deuteronomy is Moses reflecting on it. Exodus, of course, is the historical account. Joshua uh, is the writer, is the author of his own book. Joshua is the author, and here's the reasons. Number one. Jewish tradition holds to the belief, Jewish tradition doesn't mean anything except this is what the Jews always believe, that the bulk of the book was written by Joshua himself. That's what the Jews have always believed. In fact, there's no place where the book of Joshua has ever really been questioned. You're, you, everything's questioned in the, 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 the modern age and especially the postmodern age. So don't say, well, there's a critic out there. Right? The same critic is a boy who thinks he's a girl who wants to save the terrorists, but we got to kill the babies, who doesn't think the book of Joshua is authentic. It's like, well, no doubt. You don't know the difference between a baby and a terrorist, or if you're a male or a female, and now you're going to criticize the book of Joshua. It's like, oh, I'm going to take that serious. So just, we're in postmodern age. Don't listen to all the critics. Um, again, you got to take some into consideration if they got some kind of a point. But... If you don't know your sex, you don't know who the terrorists are and a baby is, you're not the person to listen to. 
Uh, point A, one A, minor additions were added by Eliezer's son after Joshua died in 2429, and then Phineas after Eliezer. And these would be the priests. So I'm going to look right there, 2429 of the book of Joshua. And now we're starting in the book of Joshua at the back. So I'm going to say Joshua wrote the book of Joshua, but then at the end, chapter 24, uh, looking in 28, chapter 24, verse 28, then Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. In other words, you're go we're done, and you can go back to your places where we were sending you to establish your lives. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, Yahweh, died at the age of 110. So obviously Joshua's not writing this part. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Shari, Shara, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Verse 32, and this is exciting right here, this interesting verse here. And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Sechem. So when Joseph was put in a sarcophagus at the end of Genesis, Moses had taken that with him. In fact, it tells you, when he took Joseph's bones and they carried him in the wilderness, they carried him in the land, the promised land, and after everything was done, the wars were over, the people had been dispersed, they went to Sechem and they had a reburial of Joseph in his territory that had been allotted to his family. Uh, in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Sechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And Eliezer, son of Aaron, died. So people would say verses 28 through 32 would have been written by Eliezer, Aaron's son, who was Joshua's priest. But then after he dies, Phineas becomes the, the high priest. And so he would have written this. And Eliezer, son of Aaron, died and was buried at Gibeah, which had been allotted to his son Phineas in the hill country of Ephraim. And so, in other words, Phineas buries his father, Eliezer, the priest. And so that's how the book of, that's, that's those ideas there of who's writing this book. Uh, point two, the Talmud, which is the Jewish commentary. We talked about the Talmud before, uh, but that's the commentary of the law. Uh, it, it, it records all the, you know, the traditions. The, they explain the law and their traditions. Um, it says, quote, right in there, Joshua wrote his own book. So the Talmud, the Jewish commentary on this book, says Joshua wrote it himself. Uh, point three, support for Joshua's authorship, one or A, B, C, D, very quickly. The author was an eyewitness of events that happened in the book, as in chapter five, verses one through six. I will look at that. The use of the first person plural, we and us, indicate the one writing was a participant in the events. So you're going to see we, we're going to see us. He's not going to say they. Now there is a place right here. Uh, the pronoun in the Hebrew text of chapter 5 verse 1 is we, not they. Now we're going to look at that verse here just so you can see what your translations say. Because that's the big difference between we and they. And we, I can say they, my ancestors, they came over from you know Europe. I didn't say we came over because I wasn't really with them. I can say my family, but we weren't there. If I say we came over, we went to Tulsa, well, that would be me going to Tulsa. So chapter 5, verse 1, we're going to look at this verse very quickly of Judges. Chapter 5, verse 1, excuse me, excuse me, Joshua. And you can see your translations. Now, the English sometimes makes it they, but it is in the we. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan, all the Canaanite kings along the coast, heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over, their hearts melted and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. So the key word right there, until we had crossed over. And so, as it says here, in the, in the Hebrew... The first pl person plural is uh, it, it's we here, not they. The King James uh, and, and the NIV translate the pronoun we. The New American Standard follows the Septuagint, uh, and they translate it they, which again would be the 200 B.C. when it says they. 
So there's there's just info. What do you guys got? You guys got we or they? I have the English Standard Version, and it's they. Okay. So again, I hate to argue with the English Standard Version and support the King James and the NIV against the English Standard Version, but there that is one thing when it says they. Uh, it is interesting that they is found in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation. You see right there. Uh, I'm making sure I say this right. Uh, for Septuagint. Yeah, translates as they. The Greek Septuagint was written around the two, in the 200s A.D. when a, a, one of the Ptolemy uh, Philadelphus, Ptolemy Philadelphus, one of the Greek rulers, was ruling Egypt. They took the Hebrew and translated it into Greek. So the, the Greek world wanted to be able to read the Hebrew Scriptures, and also the Hebrews were Greek speakers. And Hebrews, theoretically, that's what Septuagint means. It means 70. Theoretically, 70 Hebrew scholars translated the Hebrew Scriptures into Greek for uh, Ptolemy Philadelphus in Egypt in the 200s. And that's called the Septuagint. And we still have copies of the Septuagint. Paul quotes from the Septuagint, especially when he's in Greek communities quoting the Old Testament. So, uh, that, that, that says they in the Septuagint in this verse. The Hebrew text in Masoretic would be we. Uh, and so, there's that. You can understand why someone might have switched it to they, you know, because it was, it started about they did these things. But nonetheless, that's one example. The author was Jewish according to Joshua 5, 6. The writer was one of the sons of Israel who believed he was entitled to the promised land. So again, this is one of the things about this book is, is this book is about nothing short of God fulfilling a promise. This promise, this is not just a random book. I mean, this, this book is not just, where did this come from? This comes right out of Genesis chapter 12 where God tells Abraham to leave Ur and go to the land I'm going to show you. And I promise, he says, I'm going to give this to your seed. Your offspring is going to have, this is their land. We talked about it in church yesterday. It's the Abrahamic covenant. Abrahamic covenant is not the Mosaic. Do you understand? Mosaic covenant. And we talked about this before. But understand, Joshua is fulfilling a promise God gave Abraham, confirmed to Isaac and Jacob. They went into captivity with Joseph, or went to Egypt with Joseph, and then he ended up in captivity, knowing this promise. They held on to this promise, knowing this land is going to be ours. In fact, what is it, Genesis 15 or 16? God tells him, and when he, when he makes the Abrahamic covenant, cuts the covenant with him, your descendants will be kept, will become slaves in another country, but you'll come back after four generations. In the fourth generation, you'll come back up. Moses was the fourth generation. You'll come back up to this land, and in 400 years, I will give you this land. In 400 years, after being in captivity, you'll be there in 400 years. So this was a promise made in Genesis, throughout Genesis, confirmed all the way up to the end of Genesis. In fact, when Jacob dies at the end of Genesis, in Genesis, right around chapter 50, I don't know if it was chapter 49 or 50 where he actually dies, but what do they do with Jacob? Even the Pharaoh is, 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 is participating in this whole activity. They take Jacob, Joseph's father, and they take him back up into the promised land and bury him there because why? This land was promised by God to Israel back in Abraham's day. And so this, this book of Joshua is about the fulfillment of the land being given to the people of Abraham. Now, understand the difference between the Mosaic Covenant and the Abrahamic Covenant. The Abrahamic Covenant was a promise. It is called an unconditional promise, unconditional covenant. I will give you this land. This is part of God's plan for history, God's plan of salvation. God, as God is progressively revealing his plan, he is going to give Abraham's descendants this land. What happens if they don't obey? They will be punished, but they're always going to end up back in this land. You can't live in this land and be disobedient without being punished. And they've gone into captivity. They've been dispersed. They've had the Romans come in. You've got to be obedient. But at the end of the progress, the end of the story, the end of history rolling through God's plan of salvation, where will they be? They'll be in this land. I mean, we're talking a physical land. 
You can spiritualize this and get completely goofy and think, well, it's the church. God did not promise Abraham you'll be a church. He promised Abraham you'll live in this land. Joshua came and fought and killed Canaanites to get into the land, and God fought beside him because, well, I'm really talking about the church. No, he's talking about the seed of Abraham in this land in a historical setting. And if they disobey, they're going to be taken out. But they'll be brought back. So the Abrahamic covenant is an eternal promise. It's unconditional. The Mosaic covenant was a conditional covenant. I will be your... We, we saw this on Tuesday night. I will be your God and you will be my people. The verse we looked at on last Tuesday night was God tells Moses, tell them I am sent you. I am. I am your God and you are my people. In Hosea, he says, okay, chapter 1, he says, you are no longer my people and I am no longer I am. I am not your God. He said, I am not I am. In other words, you violate the Mosaic Covenant, we're done here. The Mosaic Covenant was a covenant that began and ended because it was based on obedience. You do this, out of when they violated the Mosaic Covenant, they could not end the Abrahamic Covenant. You can't end the Abrahamic Covenant because it's, it's a covenant made between a promise God made to God. Even when Abraham had cut that covenant, what is it? I don't know, remember what chapter it is, Genesis 15 or something, right around there. They make the covenant, and Abraham is put in a trance, and a smol a, a, fire, a torch of fire, a, a fire torch, and a smoldering pot pass between the sacrifices that were laid out, and they make a covenant, and that's when God talks about this four generation of 400 years, and Abraham is not even making the covenant. He's watching the covenant be made while he's in a trance, and he observes it. So the Mosaic covenant was made between man and God. And of course, that's going to fail. Man is going to fail, so the Mosaic covenant is destined to fail. And Paul makes it clear in the book of Galatians, when the people of Antioch and the people of the churches of Galatia got confused by the Judaizers coming up, and they were born again, free in Christ, saved by faith in Christ, and the Jews, the Judaizing, the believers that were still Pharisees and hadn't understood it, came up and says, oh, you've become Christians, now it's time for you to follow the law. And they began to introduce to them uh, circumcision and dietary laws. And the people in their ignorance, having come to faith in Christ, being united with God through Jesus Christ, thought, oh, we better start following the Mosaic law. And it's kind of like, Mosaic law... Where is it? And Jesus came in fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, so all these things could take place. The Mosaic law was there for a nation. The, the Mosaic law ended, it was fulfilled, totally fulfilled on the cross. And Paul says this the covenant that came 430 years after the Abrahamic covenant cannot nullify the first covenant. If you've got a covenant or a contract to buy a car and then you buy another car and you still have this contract, you say, well, I'm going to end this contract. Well, there, I'm done with this contract. It's like there are two different covenants. This contract can be ended or just because you signed this contract doesn't release you from this contract. So the Abrahamic covenant had nothing to do with circumcision, nothing to do with Abraham or a dietary laws, nothing. It was all on a promise, which leads us and this is important. Yeah, well, why are we back here? Because that leads us to the book of Joshua. Joshua is a, a book about God saying, okay, it's time to take the land. I so it's a huge, it's a big book. It's a book about God keeping his promise. What he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Joseph goes into Egypt, and then the whole nation ends up in captivity, and he comes to Moses and says, Moses, it's time. Go get my people. And it's been 400 years, it's the fourth generation, and he brings them out and takes them to the land, again, 40 years in the wilderness, and so Joshua is there. It's not just a whim, it's not just a random book about killing some Canaanites, taking them to the land. It's about God saying, okay, I promise it in Genesis, then go all the way through the, the time of Moses, and now it's time to do what I promise you to do. And what's unique about this book is so much of the writing about the land is in Genesis, it's about the promise of the land. After this, it's going to be about living in the land. And right away, the book of Judges, and then throughout the Kings, 
is disobeying while you're living in the land, and the prophets are warning you're going to get kicked out of the land, and then, of course, they get kicked out of the land. Now they're in captivity, and now they're being given a promise that, okay, I will restore you to the land, but not now. And so the book of, there's a promise of the land. There's a time when they lived in the land, but they're always disobedient. The prophets came and warned them, and they got kicked out of the land, and the promise is still there. The thing about Joshua that makes it so special, so unique, it's a time of victory. It's a time where God's promise meets Joshua and his generation who believe, and they march forward in victory, and nothing can stop them from taking the promise of God because they're obeying and they're marching and they get the land. Now, every other book is either leading up to this time or you're living in the land fading away from this time. It's like the high point of the Old Testament of taking that land. And everything else is, I mean, just we just turn the chapter over to the book of Judges and we get stupid, right? It's like, what? What? What are you doing? What? Don't you? Did you not even read the book of Josh? You do not even remember? No, they don't. They don't remember this. They forgot it, and they started drifting away. And then you get David, oh, the great King David. And you remember how ignorant he was? Not because he was ignorant. He was pursuing God, trust God. He even talked about the promise, the covenant people. But then he try, he doesn't know how to carry the ark of the covenant. People die because of that. There's so many things he doesn't understand. And again, not making fun of it, but understand, this was the victory. We were building up for it. We have the victory. We're in the land. Joshua in seven years takes it, divides it, and then we start tapering away. And we're still waiting for, again, the ultimate victory. So again, when we talk about this was written by a Jewish person like Joshua, it's someone that is claiming, no, he knows this. It's not like... What are we doing? It's just I'm, I just have this funny feeling we should conquer the land. I, I just have this funny feeling. It's, it's like, no, I have written down here the contract that God made with Abraham. Right here's the details, and uh, it's time. We're going in. He's being led by prophet. He was being led by God. He had the word of God. He had, again, the book of Genesis is in his possession. Exodus, definitely, because Moses just wrote it. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy is in his possession. And so when it's time to cross the Jordan, it's like, I know exactly what we're doing. We're taking land. What, what day is it? How many years? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's time. He's got Moses' word. He's got prophets' words. He's got the text. He's got the timing. He's got the, 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 the history. It's like, and then he's looking at a people that is totally corrupt, totally corrupt people. We're going in. And nothing can stop us. And God says, wherever you put your foot, you will succeed. And again, he's walking in faith understanding the promise. Again, people can walk in faith, but if they don't know the promise, you're making stuff up. But if you know the promise and you've got faith in the promise, you understand the difference. God gives his word a promise. You believe and act on the promise. You're going to have victory. Because God is doing it. You're believing and acting on what God is doing. What's going to stop you? But if you do not know the promise... You're going to go on feelings. What I believe is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, there's, there's no guarantee of anything. You're just believing what you want to believe. Or if you don't believe, watch. God makes a promise. Sends 12, Moses sends 12 spies up the land, Joshua and Caleb being two of them. And they come back and they, they, they've heard the promise, but they do not believe. They, are, they, know, they know more about the world, they believe the world, more than they believe the promise. So they do not believe. Promise plus not believing equals, again, well, they're wandering the wilderness, equals nothing. It equals zero. So we're going to have, and that ended 40 years in the wilderness, you're going to have to have a promise, and you're going to have to know the promise, understand the promise, so you can believe and if you're going to believe, not just, you know, believe, you're going to, what does belief lead to? Always, New Testament, James, book of James. If you believe, what are you going to do? You're going to act. You're going to obey. You're going to do. You can't have faith. James, book of James. You can't have faith and not have works. You can't believe the promise and not do something about it. Then he uses the example, guess who? Rahab. Rahab was an example. And again, that gets, gets into the Canaanites where the Canaanites were a bad people that were going to be judged because they were coming. We'll read about them next week, how bad they were. But understand, God's grace is always available. Even Rahab 
knew and had heard, they knew what was coming. They knew, they'd heard about Egypt. Egypt doesn't go through 10 plagues. Okay, I, I, I gotta quit. But you've got 10 plagues that strike Egypt if they are historic, which I believe they are. Egypt is going to know them and they're going to take action because of them. If Egypt, the powerful nation they were at that time, is struck by 10 plagues, everyone is going to hear about it, including the Canaanites, including Rahab, and what God is going to do for Israel in the wilderness and conquering the kings on the other side of the Jordan. So when Israel shows up at the border, they're not like, well, these losers, they can't do anything. They should know the, what they happened in Egypt, that God is on our doorstep. And Rahab could have repented. All of the Canaanites could have repented. But just like today, people harden their hearts and you can do a lot of things. When Jesus Christ comes back, people, I believe, when, when, when he makes his appearance, you can see his, his appearance, they, they run, they hide. They don't just melt. They don't just, there's a place where God, the God of war, destroys them. But when he first appears, they've got time to run and hide and say, hide us from him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And they're running and hiding in caves. There's some time frame in there because they're able to get regrouped, come back, form armies, put kings in position, and march against him. So when he appears, he just doesn't appear, melt everybody, and set up his kingdom. There's going to be an appearance of the Lord at some point, and some time is going to pass. I mean, day, week, month, whatever, for them to regroup. And so just like Joshua appears at the Jordan, then they watch from Jericho, they watch during flood stage, they watch the Jordan part, and Joshua walk across with Israel. I mean, they've got time to, and what they do, they locked the gates, they got their supplies ready, and they got ready to fight a war. Well, Rahab, she's going to repent. They can all says, okay, we heard what happened in Egypt, we heard what happened to the kings that fought against you, now we saw what happened to the Jordan River. Okay, just like when you see the Lord, what do you do? We're sorry, we repent. And in the day of the Lord, they call on the name of the Lord in the day of the Lord. Did they call on the name of the Lord? Not only are they wicked, they didn't call on the name of the Lord for help. They had their chance. And then they're driven out slowly. There's a land that is taken out, but they've got plenty of time over the next several years to change their mind. So not only are they morally corrupt, their actions, their wickedness, they're at the lowest state of, of human degeneracy. Uh, they've got a chance to repent, but they can't repent. And they're going to be eliminated from history. Well, that's not fair. It's like, well, God can offer peace and mercy, but he can also bring judgment. You can't have one without the other. And uh, that's what we see right there. i got more notes, and I want to get through this more. can't believe we didn't go through. I just thought we'd fly through it. I always think I don't have enough information. I'll pray, and, and uh, then we're free to go. Father, we thank you so much for the chance of looking at these things. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We do ask that we may, again, have the faith that we would hear the promise, that we would believe, and that faith will lead us to action in our own lives as we are obedient to you, as we wait for your coming kingdom. We do ask that we may rule and reign with you as Joshua did his part. We want to do our part also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time.